Hey guys, it's Ollie from Flight Comp, and I have another uh, product overview or review video. Um, this is for the Strike 3 1 meter DLG or F3K model. Um, it's made in Ukraine by a guy named Anton. Um, doesn't really have a company name, it's just a, a kid in, in the Ukraine. And he does some pretty good work. And I wanted to just go over some of the parts and uh, give you a close up look. And also I have my personal model that I finished and have flown and I'll, I'll give you guys a look at that and you can uh, see how the plane goes together. It's a pretty easy build, um, pretty conventional if you're already used to building uh, DLGs. Um, the tail and the aileron horns, the cables and springs, it's all really simple stuff. But the fuselage is really compact and small so the install for the uh, radio gear and the servos and the fuselage can be a bit tricky because you don't have a whole lot of room here so it's pretty cramped so that's one of the things I'm gonna go over I really like my strike 3 uh, this is my my model here and my uh, my color scheme um, it's super fun to fly I've had a blast with it uh, I've only been out with it maybe two or three times and I'm still tuning it a little bit. But I'll talk about this and, and the build I did and how, how this has been flying for me. But right now, let's take a uh, closer look at some of the parts on the Strike 3. Um, let's start with the wing. It's a solid core wing with the typical, you know, um, spread toe carbon. Typical construction method for uh, all modern F3K models. It's got a uh, little bump kind of fairing front and back. Holes, recessed holes for the wing mount screws. No gap seals. You could put your own on if you really wanted to, but I don't think they're necessary. The uh, finish quality of the Strike 3 is good. Uh, I wouldn't call it very good. It's, it's pretty typical of most um, solid core F3K models these days. There is a little bit of orange peel or uh, bumpiness um, coming through the carbon from the, uh, the foam. But again, it's pretty typical of uh, most F3K models on the market. Here's the fuselage. It is a bottom mount elevator. You have uh, metal inserts. I believe they're steel. They could be aluminum. I think they're steel inserts for um, the mounting bolts. And slip on nose cone. And if we take that off. You'll see the very interesting feature of this model is it has access holes on both sides of the fuselage and that actually makes um, installing the servos and your receiver and battery and hooking up your cables and everything much easier. It's got uh, row cell foam um, pads top and bottom inside the fuselage. That creates a flat surface where you can bond your brick of servos into the fuselage. You, ba you basically install the servos, um, you cut the tabs off them, wrap them with tape or, or shrink wrap, glue them together in a brick, and slide them in here and glue it down top and bottom. It's a very neat and unique way of uh, installing the servos. Battery and receiver go right here and it's a very, very tight fit. Um, one thing I want to point out is, on some of these models, the wing can be a tight fit on the fuselage, and I've found that sometimes there's a little bit of resin buildup around this um, extrusion, this nub on the fuselage, the, um, the metal mounting point. And if you just take your an X-Acto knife and pick away any excess resin that has come up around this um, mounting point so you just have clean metal all the way around that the wing on, on both of these the wing um, tends to go on a lot easier so you might want to take a look at that uh, if you get one of these to make sure that your wing and fuselage mount together nicely 
there's the fuselage, uh, typical tail parts. Here's the rudder. Um, this is the uh, recess uh, where the boom goes on the fuselage. Um, fairly standard for these models. On mine, the boom would only go in um, a little bit, maybe 10 millimeters, and it was pretty tight. So what I did is I, I took some uh, 220 sandpaper and rolled it up and basically just twirled it in this hole to get rid of some of the excess foam that was in there. And I kept doing that until the boom went in pretty deep. And then I lined it up and glued it on. And back here, you're going to want to scuff up this part of the fuselage, obviously, for a good bonding before you you put the boom onto the uh, the rudder onto the boom. Elevator again, the standard DLG uh, solid core and carbon part um, bottom mount elevator. Now the weights on these parts. Um, this fuselage is uh, 20 grams with the cone. The rudder is three grams, elevator four, and the wing I believe is 50 grams, or 52 grams. Now Anton says the flying weight of this model is between 110 and 120 grams. I think that's a little um, hopeful of an estimate. Uh, mine is at 125 grams flying weight. You could probably get it down to 125, uh, one, uh, 120, maybe 122, 123, somewhere in there. But I don't think you're going to see a flying weight below 120. I think a, a accurate number would be between 120 and maybe 128 grams uh, flying weight. Here is the parts bag that you get with the Strike 3. It's pretty extensive. You get the... Um, the pull cables, plastic sheathing for the aileron push rods. You get the aileron push rods, a throw peg, and control horns all the way around ailerons and tail, and some metal crimps for the um, pull cables. And then you also get the um, wire for the um, springs on the tail. Now the peg is very blocky and square, and you're going to want to do some shaping on this. You're going to want to round off the corners and make it nice and comfortable. And I actually tapered the blade portion. I put angles on each side just so there's not, just so it would go on the wing easier and it's uh, not as much material on it. Not a big deal. I'll show you the peg on my model. Okay, here's my Strike 3 in the Flight Comp colors. I'll give you guys a look at the tail. Pretty standard, as I said before, standard control horn setup on the tail. You have the pull wires, metal crimps, um, bottom mount elevator. That all went together very easily. I don't know if you could see the um, elevator horn there. You do have to cut a notch or a slot in the pylon and the boom of the fuselage to accept the very tip of that uh, elevator control horn. I have some very detailed pictures of my build in the, on a Facebook build gallery and I'll put a link to that in the uh, description of this video if you want to get some close-up looks at um, that slot and a few other things. Again, I use some sandpaper to take some of the excess foam out of this uh, receptacle on the rudder just to get a very good um, bond between the boom and the rudder and to make sure that the, the boom went as far in as possible. You can see the gap between the trailing edge of my elevator and the leading edge of my rudder is probably maybe seven, six or seven millimeters. So you could shoot for that. Now here are uh, the aileron control horns. What I did on these, since these are bottom mounts, I actually um, stood back the leading edge of this control horn from the hinge line three millimeters. So the distance from here to here is three millimeters. And so that puts the actual um, pivot point slightly behind the hinge line, which is not ideal. 
but it does allow you to get um, really ad adequate um, down flap throw without binding up the um, push rod here when the flap is deflected or without the um, horn interfering in the in the wing now I ran up my sheathing on the aileron push rods as far back as I could go with the uh, flap deflected fully down so I basically deflected the flap down and ran the sheathing up until it hit the horn and then that was the position where I, I glued it down and it's it's glued the entire distance of the um, slot there's a pre-cut slot here in the fuselage and it's glued the entire distance and it's also glued in right here on the inside so it's very well supported and I haven't noticed any flutter at all with this on launch here's my peg installation um, ignore this carbon patch I messed up I was cutting the notch in the wing with a, a razor saw and I was putting a lot of pressure on it because there's a, a piece of carbon toe that goes around here and when I got through that toe the the saw kind of slipped and it went a little too far so it cut the skin back a little too far so I just threw a carbon patch on there you don't need this patch at all um, you can see on my horn it's nice and round I rounded it off top and bottom and I did a little bit actually a little bit of polishing so I rounded it off and sand, wet sanded the edges with 600 grit and then I ran a little bit of thin CA around all the edges and then I wet sanded that with 1500 and did a little bit of polishing on it just so the edges of this um, horn are really nice and smooth and you're not going to get any carbon fiber splinters in your fingers and it's easy to grab onto okay so that's all really straightforward again the build is is very easy oh one more thing um, on the horns here, you can see I have my horns right up at the end of the, the ailerons, right? So I cut a notch. I cut a notch in the ailerons for the horns, but I'm right up against the end, right? And I don't think that was the most ideal thing. I think you'd want to, if I were to do this again, I would move the horn probably two to three millimeters outboard on each side right so that when i cut this notch i wasn't basically at the root of the aileron i'd be inside of the root and i'd have material on both sides i don't have material on the outside edge to bond the horn and it doesn't seem to be an issue but um, again i would probably mount this horn about three millimeters inboard of the aileron cut or outboard i should say towards the tip so that's another tip i'll give you guys so don't, don't make them the same mistake that i did all right, let's get to the good stuff here. The uh, servo installation. Now, my servo installation is very, very similar to the pictures that uh, Anton sent me for his build, except that I would say the distance from the edge of my servos to this part of the fuselage is half that of the pictures he showed me. He had a servo stopping around here maybe right and he, and he had a little bit of that plastic sheathing sticking out here so he had a pretty big gap here and I figured I didn't need that because I wanted to make as much room as possible up front for my receiver and battery so what I did was I, I tried to run my servos as far back as possible to make as much room here for my battery and receiver and I'm really happy I did that because if I had put these servos where he said to put them I don't think I would have been able to fit my receiver and battery now that being said I am using a very big receiver and a 600 milliamp um, like bubblegum style single cell battery and that's probably uh, bigger than you need uh, I think a lot of you guys are going to be running FR Sky equipment and um, if you are, you can use one of their small four channels and you'll take up about half the amount of space that I use with this. This is actually a Hobby King um, orange receiver for a JR radio. I happen to have it. It was a single uh, circuit board instead of the JR um, dual, dual stack circuit boards. So a standard JR receiver, even with the case out, wouldn't fit in here. I had to find a single uh, circuit board receiver so it was as flat as possible so I'm, I managed to fit that uh, Hobby King receiver in here without the case um, now it's so tight here that I don't even have room really to put a switch 
or an extension for my battery. So to turn this on, you can see basically some of the pins of the receiver sticking out here. So to turn this on, I'm basically plugging directly into the receiver to turn it on and off, which is okay. Uh, it works. I may try to figure out how to solder in a Zepsis Nano switch here, but there really isn't that much room. Uh, I kind of eyeballed it, but like I said, there's there's not much room in this thing um, for your equipment. So again, you need to use basically the smallest receiver you can possibly get. Um, if you're using FR Sky, use one of the really small four channel receivers. You'll have a lot easier time. And then um, you can see my battery is down here, right? It's that bubblegum style battery. It's a 600, 500, or 600 milliamp battery. You could probably go with a three to 400 milliamp battery and try to save even more space. Okay, um, one other thing is I put a little bit of shrink tubing, I don't know if you can see this, around the servo wires and glued the shrink tubing to the masking tape on the servos here and here. And then on this side, I did the same thing here and here. Oh, this this one came off. I'll have to re-glue that. Um, that was just to try to keep the uh, wires out of the horns and the cables. Here's one antenna I have. It's it's pointing back, and again, it's got a little bit of shrink tubing here, and it's glued down just to keep it pointing back. And then the other one just points forward, right? Um, again, you don't have much room. You're gonna have to do the best you can with this. I highly recommend you move your servos back as far as I did. Another thing too is, again, so you wrap your servo, you cut the tabs off your servos and you wrap them with tape or shrink wrap. And if you look at the pictures that Anton has, he actually has a gap between these two stacks of servos. So there's, there's a block of servos here, a little gap, and then the other block of servos. And he made that gap so that the wire coming out of the servos wouldn't jam into the case of the adjacent servo. Um, now, he did that because he put all four servos in line with each other, right? Straight line. What I did is I took the, the blocks and staggered them a little bit. So you can see that where the, where the wire comes out for the front servo, the servo sticks out a little further past this servo, right? So I can, I'm able to glue the servos together without getting interference from this wire. And I did that on both sides. I did that here too. So my servos are in one solid block. And again, that saved me more room here. I was able to get the servos further back and I mounted the servos further back here than he had. Now it's hard to see. I'll, I'll uh, post some pictures up of this. But I do have the, the, the plastic sheathing coming up all the way till about here, right? And then it's glued to the fuselage here and, and here, right? So it's very well supported. And I actually have little pieces, little balsa shims here underneath uh, the plastic um, to help glue it down. And the, the procedure I recommend for this is install aileron control horns first right make these bends in your push rod um, slide the sheathing over the push rod hook up the push rods put the wing on slide everything in make your servo brick get the the control arms on there and and the position you want put the servos in position right um, temporarily hold them down with tape or just a, a spot of glue make the bends for your um, horns right then take out the servos and pull the push rods out oh okay so before you make the bends here and you've slid the wing on and you have your push rods coming through um, mark where you want to trim the plastic sheath right and then okay so do all that Make your bends, pull everything apart, trim down your plastic sheathing, okay? Trim up your bends so they're not sticking out too far or sticking in too far. Once you've got all that, then go ahead and um, glue the sheathing down, 
with the push rods in place. Don't put the servos in yet, right? So glue, glue your sheathing down under the wing and up here on the fuselage sides, right? Let that set up, finish that up, then go and put your servos in. And I think that's the correct order to do things. If you put your servos in first, it's going to be real, a real pain in the butt to try to get in here and, and glue the sheathing down with the servos in place. So push rods first, then the servos. With the receiver and battery, you're just going to have to figure out what combination of receiver and battery will, will work for you with your gear to get a good fit in here. Um, but yeah, but you know, it is a very tight fit in the fuselage, but on the flip side of that, it makes it really compact. It looks proportional for its size. There's other one meter DLGs on the market that have a really fat, pudgy fuselage. And this looks just more correct to me. It looks more streamlined. Um, it looks like a true kind of scaled down F3K model. So I'm going to actually get the radio and turn it on and um, share some of my settings with you guys. And, um, and I'll go over a few more points about the airplane. All right, I got my trusty XG8 here and the airplane is on. I'm not going to really give you accurate... Um, uh, measurements on the throws but you can see this is sort of where I'm at I have a slight amount of reverse differential in the throws I get plenty of um, down flap and you can see what I was talking about you know with the flaps fully down there's very little gap between this plastic sheathing and the control horns just to make a very for a very rigid um, push rod installation now when the wing is clean like this with no camber the plane flies pretty fast right it's actually a very fast flying model so I found that flying it with about uh, two to three millimeters of camber really slows it down nicely and I would say this is my main cruise mode. Uh, if it's if it's pretty calm, calm air, or if I'm in light lift, or uh, it's the air is not really active or bumpy, I'll fly it around um, with about two or three millimeters of camber, and it just slows it down and kind of settles the model out a little bit. I also have camber on a slider, and right now my max camber is about four to five millimeters, as you can see. And I don't think it would really need more than that. I haven't tried it with more. It seems to work really well. At, at this 4 to 5 millimeters of camber, it kind of starts to get a little stall happy and a little wallowy. Um, so I don't think I would be running more than that. And then I have a um, speed mode for launch and, and just general um, reflex for penetration. I started out with a lot of uh, aileron to rudder uh, mix on the tail. Um, but it would actually kind of uh, nose down in the turns, and I started um, with um, taking out reverse differential, and that didn't help too much. So what I ended up doing was I took out all the um, rudder mix, then I kind of played with the differential and got it turning well, where the nose wasn't um, pointing in or out of the turn. And then I added just a little bit more rudder uh, mix. Um, I only have maybe 15 or 20 percent um, aileron the rudder mix. And it's flying a lot better now. Um, but, so those are my basic throws. Um, one thing I will say, this plane is very sensitive. Um, it's very touchy and nimble. It makes it a whole lot of fun, but it can be sketchy on your first flights. So I would say start with some very moderate throws. You know, um, I would start with maybe half the amount I have here. So I would probably start with like 7 millimeters up and down on the ailerons. And for the elevator... You know, I would go maybe five or six millimeters up and down just to start with. And then you can dial up your throws from there as you like it. This plane is super sensitive. It's really it's really fun. It's pretty aerobatic. It rolls well. It loops well. I really enjoy flying it. Um, I think, I don't know where my CG is because this won't fit on my um, my uh, digital CG scale. The the cord is too narrow. But I have a feeling I'm I'm fair I'm a little tail heavy, so I'm gonna try putting a few grams of weight in the nose, and that'll settle it out a little bit. And it might not be as touchy, but I think just in general, playing this size is gonna be uh, always a little more sensitive and touchy. Um, 
So yeah, I'm going to play with the CG a little more. Like I said, I don't know exactly where it's at right now. But um, it, man, this thing is just, is just awesome to fly. If you're into RC gliders, uh, you're not going to regret having one of these in your car at all times. I mean, you can fly this anywhere. You can take it off a tiny little slope and fly it. You can fly it in little tiny lots. You know, you don't need a ton of space. It's really agile and nimble. And, you know, it launches really good. I'm surprised by how high it launches, and also the penetration for such a small airplane. Um, this thing has pretty good penetration. I mean, it moves out pretty good. Obviously, it's not as as good as a, 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 a one and a half meter F3K model, but I was really surprised at how well this thing penetrates. And I found that I really enjoy flying this thing more in um, active air, and when it's a little more when it's a little windier. Um, I just, I don't know, I just, it just seems to be a lot more fun, it seems to work better um, than, than just dead flat calm air. Um, that's just my take on it, this thing is a ton of fun, um, pretty easy to build, like I said, basically the hardest, the hardest part of this thing really is cramming all your gear in the nose, um, but once you figure that out, you know, it's, it's a very straightforward, easy build. Uh, so I'm going to keep flying this. I'm going to play with the CG a little more, and I might do um, a little more tuning on the aileron throws. But yeah, so that is a uh, quick look, or maybe not so quick because this video will drag out forever. Uh, it's, a, it's a look at the Strike 3 from Anton in the Ukraine. Um, big thumbs up for me. You know, I'm really happy with this thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's a blast to fly. And this thing's going to go with me to all my contests, you know, my F5J contests or F3J stuff. And I'm just going to pull this out, you know, the start of the day or the end of the day and just, just have a really good time with it. So, all right, guys, thanks so much for watching. Sorry this one kind of drug out a little bit, but that was a quick look at the uh, Strike 3. And I'll see you guys in the next one.